Thank you, John. All right, if you have any troubles, uh, if you, for some reason the sound goes out or two, just type in the message box. So we'll get started on managing root rot pathogens for production nurseries. So as a brief overview, we'll cover very briefly the, the levy funded project under which this webinar has been produced, conditions to produce a healthy root system, root rot pathogens, sort of some basic biology and how they spread, and then we'll talk about managing root rot pathogens. So the project has a lot of different aspects. It's a levy funded project. So we are producing a lot of fact sheets, pest management plans. These are located on the nursery production FMS website. Hopefully you guys have seen that. In fact, just raise your hand if you've ever visited that website. Um, so it's not just information resources that we're doing. We are also providing diagnostic support through Grow Help Australia, just one, okay? But I think I recognize at least a couple names there that have also looked at the website. So Grow Help Australia is a pest and disease diagnostic laboratory. So all production nurseries get basically a subsidized rate and NIAS accredited nurseries receive uh, 10 free samples per year. So take advantage of that as needed. We're doing educational activities, so that's where this comes in. And we're also running workshops in each state and territory every year, the projects. And the project finishes at the end of next year. We also provide some more corporate industry support when certain pests or diseases are detected. We have access to a lot of information and we provide some, some assistance and uh, advice as needed. So let's get into it. Part of managing root rot pathogens is just producing healthy plants. And we're gonna talk about some of the non-pathogenic factors that can lead to, a, to poor root health. So that hopefully you don't do that and you produce a healthy root system, which then can produce a healthy plant. So we'll also cover how we monitor the root system because if you don't monitor your root system, well, obviously bad things can happen. So you wanna have a root system that is very healthy because stressed plants are more susceptible to diseases and obviously people don't wanna buy a plant that's looking dodgy. So good growing conditions are fairly obvious. You probably all know this stuff but sometimes the stuff you know can fall into the recesses of your mind and it helps to have it be pulled to the forefront. So your fertilizer regime, including your EC, the, the, the type of fertilizer can affect your root system as, as well as the pH, which is, can be interrelated. Air filled porosity can, can change the way the plant respires and photosynthesizes, so the O2, CO2 exchange. Obviously, moisture, temperature has an effect, planting depth and pot size, all of these things can affect your plant and either produce a good plant or, or a not so good plant. So let's look at some of these things in more detail because it can help to disentangle it. If you get a root rot or evidence of rotting roots, it's not only a root rot pathogen that could be causing the problem. So nutrient disorders can actually cause cause problems in their plants. So, and if you would like to type in some of your experience with various different plants that you've grown and perhaps a nutrient disorder or some of these things as we go on, if you're happy to have that shared, uh, then that'd be great and, and we can interact in that way. So nutrient disorders can cause poor root growth. They can cause root nip tip necrosis. Sometimes these root tip necrosis symptoms or root death, root tip death are not always easy to see and you need to actually wash the roots to be able to start to see that there's a problem there. Sometimes you get unusual growth with nutrient disorders or perhaps uh, hormone application. Sometimes we see little gall or, or just strange for want of a 
technical term, weirdo root growth, and that can be because of a whole range of non-pathogenic factors. Particularly calcium and boron, not just for roots, but for all aspects of the plant, they can produce some pretty wild symptoms. Fertilizers obviously have, make a difference for your nutrient regime. High nitrogen levels, and just as one example, high nitrogen levels can cause succulent growth, which is obviously good from looking at it, looking at a nice healthy plant, but it can make that plant more susceptible to infection. Whereas the contrast being low nitrogen levels can weaken that plant and predispose them to plant the plants to infection. So really what you want is have the Goldilocks zone for all of your nutrients so that you know you don't have a stressed plant. Particularly with fertilizer choice, it can influence pH. So your sulfur-based products can sometimes reduce your pH. There are other fertilizers that can raise your pH. And on that topic, we have seen a number of cases where we, this is high pH on the right here. It's, it's always challenging taking good photos of a root system. But here you can see that the top layer of roots, there's a thick mat there. And this is a 300 mil pot, by the way. And underneath, it's just wasted. There's hardly any root system. There were no pathogens present here, but when queried, they did a test and the pH was somewhere above 8.7, because that was the limit of the test that the test could handle. So obviously a root system like this is going to do bad things and the above ground symptoms of that plant basically look like broad mite sort of uh, deformed growth. But not only can it affect directly your, your root growth, it can in inhibit nutrient uptake. So the roots can be there and look healthy sometimes but they can't do their job as well as they should be able to do if the pH was correct. So low pH can reduce your water uptake, inhibit CO2 assimilation, and it can disrupt some other physiological functions, which you probably will need to read about more yourself. They were, when I was doing some prep for this webinar, they were um, some of the physiological functions that can be disrupted from pH are described in a lot of detail online if you, if you do some searching. Okay, so low airfield porosity. You've probably all had cases where you've had a growing media that's become very thick, a sediment become a, a highly a, without oxygen. So that's hypoxia, it's low oxygen or anoxia being without ox oxygen at all. So different plants ha have different abilities to withstand low oxygen environments. In general, when the plant gets to a point where it's, it's low for that plant, you get decreased respiration, decreased metabolic activity, changes in the way metabolism occurs. So <clears throat> it can mean that they have to respire anaerobically instead of aerobically, and that affects the amount of energy that's in the plant so that it can't effectively can't grow very well. Ultimately, if you have a really low oxygen environment, you can have cell death and you get a root, root death. This is one of the biggest factors, so low air fill porosity and in combination with a wet growing environment, wet feet can drastically increase your risk of pathogen infected infection. So you can see here in this in this image where you've got your your healthy roots towards the top, and then the rest of the plant is is the very few healthy roots. And we did isolate uh, pythium from this but probably the cause was a low oxygen environment. So potentially if these plants had simply been put in a growing media that had a greater air filtrosity, perhaps were better suited to this particular plant, 
they may not have had any problem whatsoever. And there's a link to more information, or you can just, again, with each of these factors, you can pretty much do a, a internet search on low oxygen environment effect on plant roots, and you'll get a lot of good information. Temperature, who has uh, heated growing beds? If you just raise your hand, if you have heating growing beds, particularly in the cooler climates, that can be very important to keep the plant growing. And uh, the high temperature can be bad as well. Temperature affects the rate of growth and root development. And part of producing a healthy plant is having a healthy root system. And, and that will, we'll talk about that more as the webinar goes on. Planting depth, I think, is, is important. And it's done automatically by a lot of growers. But it's often overlooked as a potential cause for failure to thrive, particularly. So for seed germination, obviously we know if it's planted too deep, plants don't germinate, or seeds don't germinate so well. But deep planting, it has reduced gas exchange. You can get poor growth from it. You can have increased risk of pathogen attack, particularly as a crown rot, but also then root rots. And so in this case here on the, on the right, you can see how the, the roots started growing fairly low in the pot. The, the, the system, the root, the, sorry, the growing media was up at this stage here, really should have been down here. There's obviously also been some poor fertilizer practices um, and the plants were just, well, you, you can see what the plants look like. So it's important when you're looking at failure to thrive to rule out all of these sorts of things as well as look at the potential for uh, a pathogen being involved. So this is where we get to some of this root structure. So pot size obviously makes a big difference, particularly for plants that are, are long-lived, that grow very tall, a, a, a strong root structure is critical and if you have something like uh, this J root here you can see how the vascular tissue is brown where it compared to the healthier bits and at this point basically it's all looking pretty much dead and when there's that sort of a constriction then you don't get as much exchange of water nutrients and whatnot so you have a major problem. You also have to keep in mind that your rot can occur very low in the system. So this is a, a cucumber and you can see that the root rot or the rot has occurred right at the base. Sometimes we get these rots and the root system can actually appear surprisingly healthy and you can get a base rot and right at the very base, this, so the ground line could be around here, and the rot doesn't occur until very low in the root system. So when you're looking at root structure, root health, and you have a problem, it's important to keep in mind that the problems may not be obvious. With the, the point, the location where there is a problem may not be obvious. So when you're doing your monitoring, which is pretty much what we're talking about, Obviously, you can't pick up every plant and look at the roots, not practical. But you can be completed strategically, particularly if you're potting up, you should be taking note of your root structure, taking note of any sedimentation. So this pot here obviously has had some issues where there's sedimentation very fine at the bottom, um, the larger ones at the top. So you can then get an idea of the root health. And I would even go so far as to say that when you're potting up, it's worthwhile taking a few plants, washing the roots, and seeing if, if everything is normal. Particularly your high-risk plants. Be looking at them more regularly. Look at when the plants, when you expect the plants to have filled the pot, have they actually filled the pot? 
if they haven't filled the pot, what's, what's happened? Is there something that you can explain that is logical? So make sure you don't disengage your brain and go, oh, they haven't, I'll just wait until next week and pot them up then. Oh, wait a second. How come they haven't? Oh, well, we've had this cold spell, so that's the reason why. Okay, then that's fine. If you have a logical explanation for why the plants may not have filled their pot, then you may not need to do anything extra. But if you really start to see some failure to thrive, then you need to do some investigation as to why there has been some that abnormal plant growth. And if that abnormal plant growth occurs, then the type of investigation that you do is, is this sort of thing. So you need to cut the roots. So the bottom right hand picture is the cut root. On the face value, the top right picture, it doesn't even look that bad. It's superized. It looks normal. It's not until you cut it open that you start to see these dark vascular strands that maybe indicate that there is a problem there. When you wash the roots, sometimes you can find the root tips, the showing signs of death that aren't obvious when the growing media is on the pot, on the roots, sorry. And you can then also better look for the root structure. Uh, are there J roots? Uh, is the tap root going in the right direction? Are they showing bends in weird ways? Those sorts of things you can ask yourself and reassure yourself and write down, excuse me, so that you have a record that you are producing a healthy plant. And that's important for, for reasons we'll talk about later in the webinar. Cut the tap root. This is what we were just talking about before. Cut the tap root and see what the health of that vascular system is doing, as well as the vascular tissue above the ground level, particularly when there is an abnormal growth. I'm not saying you need to do that for healthy plants, uh, because then you're destroying the plant. So if you consider the sorts of actions that we were just talking about, how often do you monitor root health? John, would you mind sharing that poll, please? So how are you up looking? Now. Great. So is it rarely, occasionally, sometimes, frequently? Let's see. Still a couple of All people right. haven't responded, but nearly there. Excellent. All right. So oh. three, two, one. John, you wanna? Okay. Yep, closed. Okay, and we'll just share, you wanna this. share that. You share that, please, yep. Yep, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so sometimes, some people occasionally, some people sometimes, some people frequently, That's that's good. Glad there's no rears. It's unfortunate that we do sometimes come across people that rarely look at root health or send in samples for diagnostic testing and there's above ground problems. You go, oh, what's the roots doing? Oh, I haven't looked at that. Anyway, um, you want to hide that please, John, and I'll keep on, oh, I think, questions. Have we had uh, any questions typed in? Uh, no questions at the moment, but that doesn't mean to say you can't still ask questions. Um, feel free anytime. Don't leave, don't leave until the very end. Just ask the question away and we can get Andrew to um, hopefully answer them as we go through the <laughs> webinar at the same time. Yeah, thanks. Make, no. make it more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I might handball it or even say, hmm. I need to look into that one. Yes. <laughs> a lot of these things okay. in the nursery sector or looking after plants are fairly obvious. As I said earlier, I mean monitoring root health doesn't take doesn't take a rocket science. Right, scientist. It's pretty simple. 
thankfully, otherwise we'd all be in trouble. Um, okay, so this is the next section. What does it mean to be a soil or waterborne pathogen? And we're gonna look at some basic biology of, of, of root pathogens generally. Okay, so how do they spread? Now, obviously this is a, a leaf, a, a, a leaf symptom, but the, the concepts are similar. You can have your necrosis of leaves or roots, you can get fungal growth on those roots or on the stem, and you can have the spores of that pathogen present in the growing environment. So the canidia, which is sort of a technical term for spores, there are lots of different types of spores, and some are short-lived, some are long-lived. Then you have the fungal growth, which is sort of a fuzzy hair-like structure. So these are the hyphae. And when it's in a thick mat, it's called mycelium. That's not all, the, the words aren't that important. What's important is to understand that if you start seeing lots of fuzzy growth on your plants, ooh, why is that there? Don't disengage your brain. Realize that there's something wrong and take the next steps early in the piece so it doesn't become a bigger problem. So there are, most fungi have various specialized survival structures, particularly soil-borne pathogens. They have these structures that can survive decades, pr practically indefinitely from a horticulture point of view. And water mold pathogens, so your Phytophthoras and Pythiums in particular, they have structures that can, spores that can swim. And we've got a video of that to show you soon. Now, these pathogens can spread in various different ways. A lot of times it's passively. So besides your Phytophthoras that can swim, most of the time it is passive. So the growing media that is infested with the, um, that material, can be moved around, the pots and equipment placed, particularly if it's placed on the ground, then becomes at risk of becoming infested. And then if you go to the next plant, it can potentially spread it. So organic matter from the infected crops that maybe falls onto the ground in the growing area, even though the pathogen may not be able to move the way Phytophthora moves, they continue to survive and have and and can be moved easily into plants in the vicinity, the vicinity such that they can infest and infect the plants. So oh, pretty obviously your soil-borne pathogens are linked to the soil or the growing media, and your waterborne pathogens are linked to water. So your irrigation, the water reservoirs, your runoff, any flood flooding or standing water in your growing area, that's a higher risk for having a soil-borne or waterborne pathogen get into your plants. Your overhead irrigation and rainwater splash. You'd be surprised to have a splash of water on a mass of, of fungal spores can then be projected into the air in a similar way to a sneeze, maybe not quite at such velocity, but the same concept is there. It gets propelled up into the air and can then move into closer contact with your plants, potentially. And the same water on equipment and tools. It's also important to realize that your mother stock plants or your living and infected plant material, these will obviously contain both soil and waterborne pathogens that can be could be cause of root rot or, or a vascular wilt. They're very much related. So in many cases, the pathogens that are soil-borne are also waterborne, and vice versa, but there are some exceptions. If you if you're if you don't know, it's best to assume the worst and then go from there. And then we will talk more about how to have these things identified soon. There are lots of names. We're not going to go into the biology of each one of these pathogens. Not all that. I think that if we better to spend our time more generally. And if you end up dealing with one of these 
specifically, then you can look at the literature that's online or, or ask a pathologist or, or contact us, so and so forth. So let's go to some general basic biology and some general jargon that, that pathologists will use. So you've got your pathogen, which is the actual organism that causes the problem. The symptoms are, let's say, the visible reaction. Let's say you start to see wilting or you start to see a root rot. That's your visible, uh, the reaction to the pathogen. The disease is all of those symptoms considered collectively that are caused by the pathogen. So the symptoms and the sign are sort of similar. The sign being some of the visible evidence of the presence of the pathogen, but perhaps not the actual symptom. And we'll, I'll, talk, I'll show you some of the pictures that helps distinguish those two. And some of the, that inoculum is the infective biological object. So the spores. So you saw some of the picture of the spores previously. We don't like to go into too much detail with all those spores because, I mean, in a nursery setting, there aren't many people that have the skills to identify pathogens and it's not all that helpful. You're better off talking to a specialist to give you the advice you need for managing these, these pathogens and identifying it. What is important is that the greatest inoculum load, so the greatest number of infective biological objects, infective pathogens occur in the top 30 centimeters of your soil and growing media. Now obviously for a nursery, that is basically all of your pot. Unless you're dealing with very large containers or in-ground crops or in-ground mother stock, basically everything is higher risk in terms of an infected plant. So what are these symptoms that they can cause? They can cause a root rot, obviously, failure to thrive. They can produce some nutrient deficiency symptoms. They can cause a wilt. They can cause plant death. Sometimes you can get these situations where the root pathogen will induce a leaf spot, or in this case, a deformity of the leaves. And it can be a bit of a red herring and it can make you easily be focused on the spot above the ground without concentrating on what's happening below ground. So in this case here, we have a root system that on the whole, I mean, you look at that root system at first glance, it looks pretty good. But when you start looking closely, which is what we did, you can see the root tips are a little bit brown, and when you stick it under a microscope slide, you're seeing these structures here, which is the sign of, so this would be the symptom and that's the sign of the pathogen. You see these spores present in the, in the root tips, which effectively make the plant produce this abnormal growth above the ground. So it's easy to be sidetracked and go, okay, I need to spray for broad mites because it's, it's a plant that gets infected and it looks like that symptom. It's easy to be derailed. So in some cases, root rots are simple. In some cases, you've really got to be switched on to find these things and wash the roots. I think that's a good illustration for the importance of washing the roots. And also to understand what is normal for your plant. So if we didn't know better, you could, see these roots here that are larger, I mean, that, that's part of normal growth. There's no evidence of rot. When you cut open that root, it's healthy underneath. Some plants will naturally have very dark roots. So anyone who's grown mangoes will know that the roots, when you pull out of the pot, they look black. But underneath, the steel of that root is, will be healthy, or it won't be, but it's for the power of cutting open that root. Okay. So different pathogens survive in water or soil for different lengths of time, and different structures of the same pathogen survive for different lengths of time. So this sort of comes back, it's better to assume that most of your soil-borne pathogens 
have the capacity to stay in your growing environment indefinitely if you don't do something about it. So again here, so this is an Exora with uh, Fusarium root and crown rot. These little white dots are fruiting bodies of the Fusarium. There are probably millions of spores in this environment. When water hits that, they can be splashed onto the nearby plant and in, in potentially infect the neighbor. Another aspect that's important to keep in mind is that some pathogens can survive on alternate hosts without causing disease and can stay in that dead plant material for quite a long time. Okay. So we don't need to focus on specific pathogens to understand some of these general concepts so that when it comes time to you actually dealing with a problem, which hopefully you don't, but if you do, then you've got a better understanding of some of the important points that you should look into. Anybody who's done any sort of pathology uh, or one of our workshops that John and I have done, you may well have seen this host pathogen environment triangle, sort of the disease triangle. So to have a disease present, so the out, outward manifestation of all of the pathogen being causing a problem, you have to have the right host. You have to have a host that's susceptible to that pathogen. You have to have the actual pathogen. If you don't have the pathogen, obviously you can't have a disease. And you have to have the right environment. If your environment is not suitable, you can potentially have the host and the pathogen present, but hopefully you don't. We'll talk about that later. And not get the disease. And when we're talking about the environment, we have to think about sort of the biotic component, so the microorganisms that are living in the growing media and around the root, as well as the non-pathogenic factors, which we've already sort of talked about in the first part of the webinar, so temperature, humidity, rainfall, growing media conditions, all that sort of stuff. These all play an important role in producing the right environment such that disease is caused. And the, this picture here is another illustration where sometimes you can get this root rot right at the base of your cutting and the roots that go further out and you see around the outside of a pot may actually appear healthy, but you're still seeing symptoms of decline. So that's part of the power of washing, washing the roots and, and look, having a good look. In most instances, once a root rot pattern infected for the rest of its life. Fungicides are generally unable to eradicate the infection. It might reduce the symptoms, and we'll talk more about that in the last part of the webinar, but it, they generally don't eradicate. So some pathogens can be What's pythium, particularly, there's some other pathogens that only tend to affect seedling. So the plants may grow out of the disease, but not always. It's worthwhile knowing what you are dealing with so that you can manage it in the best possible way. And we'll talk more about the implications of that uh, soon. Okay, so water molds are fun in some ways sort of the animal of fungal community. They're not actually true fungi. They, that's why they're in a separate group. They're called water molds. So Phytophthora pythium, hopefully you haven't actually encountered them, but you probably have heard about them. So these are the sporangia, and you can see the zoo spores in here. They can actively swim potentially for hours under good conditions, and they are attracted to the nutrients that are released, released from the root tips. So they'll swim along a water film. They can potentially swim from one pot to the next or be splashed and then swim to the next plant. Let's illustrate that uh, here and hopefully it works. Just raise your hand if you can see the video playing. No, right there, there we go, okay, great. So I um, apologize for the quality of this image. It looked brilliant when we were doing it. 
And then after we were done doing all of these things, we realized that settings we were wrong, we couldn't work it out. But you can still get the idea here. The zoo spores are coming out of these, the sporangia and they're swimming away. Now, probably the whole screen represents about a millimeter, maybe, maybe less than a millimeter. So these things are small and they're fast. They can cover some distance. There are more images, more videos like this online. So if you want to see more images of zoo spores coming out of Phytoph of Sporangia, you can you just can do a search on YouTube or other things of Phytophthora being released, zoo spores being released from Sporangia. I think that sort of illustrates. You can see the number that come out of one of these Sporangia be different depending on the size and you can see how some of these ones are empty and some of them are full. All right. Uh, just, there we go. Oh. Well, we do have one question, Andrew. <clears throat> um, um, can can people hear me now? Like, look, there's, John, yeah, you said my mic is playing. Now. Yeah, it's playing up for, it was just cutting out a bit, so just keep an eye on that. Um, okay. But we do have one question. Um, someone wanted to know, with those aerial spores that you showed on the Exora, how far mm -hmm. would they actually, can they actually spread? Um, is it oh. just to the next pot or maybe you go further afield or what's your thoughts It's a good on question. That? It's a good question. Really, I think you have to ask yourself, what conditions are the plants growing in how many of those fungal spores are there. So they tend to be water, wind-driven rain can really spread these things quite fast. So if you imagine, uh, has anyone seen that old movie Twister? I'm not saying that these things can be moved kilometers and kilometers, but depends on your situation. If, you, if you've got a situation where there's high winds and water is being spread around, then it's going to be further than if you've got a relatively still environment and um, un, uh, below the pot, up, bottom up irrigation sort of thing. So I guess I too that if, if you're actually removing those plants from the system, you've got to be careful not to spread the spores as well. So it'd be better to bag them, yes. you think, and then remove them. Or, or at least carefully pull them out, stick them in a bag immediately, so that uh, then when you're taking it in, into the into a bin, a smaller bin that's got a lid, and then disposed of. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and we do have another one. Um, can trichoderma control or eradicate root pathogens more effectively than fungicides? Now, I think we will be covering some biocontrol agents, um, so we might leave that one roll over yes. until the next section, um, yep. and hopefully you'll cover that one um, yes. in that section itself. Yep. Yep. All right, that sounds good. And if, if that question isn't answered adequately, then we can come back to it yeah, at the end. Yeah, we can bring it up. Yep. Okay. All okay, right, good. That's it. Next time. Thank you, John. Uh, all right, so on to the next section, which is looking at management of root rot pathogens, including the biological, cultural, and really the the, the golden uh, rule is to exclude the pathogens. So your best option is to exclude that pathogen. Um, John, just if if the mic drops out, just cut in because there's no point in me talking about, over nothing. Like, yep, you know what I mean? We'll yep. do. Keep an eye. Yep, keep an eye on you. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So, best management action is exclusion. If you are using dam water or river water, creek water, and you are not disinfesting it, eventually you're going to cause yourself some pain. 
even rainwater collected from roofs is relatively high risk compared to disinfested water or town water, at least when it comes to the pathogen, the presence of pathogens. So your spores can potentially become airborne, go into the atmosphere, rain can bring them down, and then you can collect them in your tank. So be aware that that is a potential source of adding pathogen to your plant. It's best to use a reputable, reputable growing media supplier that has excellent quality control around composting. If, thing, if the media isn't composted well, then potentially there's greater potential for a pathogen being present in the media. If you want to be sure, you can pasteurize your own media. And what we have heard from growers that have gone down that road is they've said, I didn't think I needed to pasteurize my media, but as soon as I started doing it, I started to see gains in plant growth. So I'll leave that up in, in your capable hands to investigate whether that's something that is worthwhile. Only propagate from pathogen-free mother stock. And that sounds patently obvious, but there are times when mother stock plants can be infected with a root pathogen that, let's, let's say fusarium being a case in point, the root pathogen can be present in the roots, it can go up the vascular system into even the growing tips. The plant can potentially look healthy. You can take cuttings from that and propagate a problem that where those those cuttings can just die in the propagation area. So anytime you start to see your cuttings die on a regular basis, you have to have a major red flag saying, are my mother stock plants actually free of a pathogen? And quarantine incoming stock. Hopefully you all do that. Please raise your hand if you do in quarantine your incoming stock. Um, so particularly your high risk plants, the ones I'm seeing some, some hand, hands have gone up, thank you. The high risk stock particularly. Quarantine it, don't put a fungicide on it because if you put the fungicide on, as we'll talk about soon, you can potentially mask the symptoms. You won't be able to tell whether or not they're having any root rot symptoms. So make sure that you know that they're free of pathogens before they get incorporated into the nursery proper. Hygiene. If you've ever talked to a pathologist or perhaps the industry reps, They'll probably go on and on ad nauseum about hygiene. It's very important. You've got to eliminate your freestanding water in the growing area. Easier to have it be spread around, easier to get onto equipment, easier to get onto shoes be spread. Water should drain away from the growing meat areas. Foot bar, put in foot baths where appropriate. Now, foot baths are about risk. If you are growing your plants on a bench, which is best practice, on mesh where it has the water drain out and doesn't stand around the bottom of the pot. They're all, and you've got no soil on the ground, but you've got your rocks and every, the area is clean. Maybe foot baths aren't necessary, except perhaps in high risk areas. I don't know about you, if I want to walk into a propagation area and there's algae and organic matter all over the floor, I'm immediately asking them, hey, what, what are you doing about this? floor situation, because that can produce all sorts of problems, particularly with fungus gnats, which can also spread soil-borne diseases. So perhaps you want to have a foot bath near your propagation area anyway, even though most of the time propagation is on benches, it will help you keep your feet clean so you don't spread organic matter. It's just a purely practical solution. So use foot baths as appropriate to reduce risk. If you've got plants on, on rocks, and you have areas that are staff spreading soil or growing media or other organic matter on their boots. Well, that's something that you also want to tidy up in terms of hygiene, foot baths, 
in a, in a foot washing area or just clean up the dirty areas so that people only walk with clean shoes, that's good too. All part of hygiene, keeping the growing areas clear of crop debris and growing media wherever possible. So disinfest your growing areas. So let's say you've got a, had a crop, it's been grown even healthy. That crop gets moved out. You can disinfest that growing area from time to time to make sure to, to help reduce the risk. And that potentially can be with an, any range of different products. Sometimes people use copper products, but do be aware that if you're using copper products repeatedly and the roots then hit that copper product, if they start to show evidence of copper toxicity, well, that's just something to be aware of. There's a lot of different um, fungicides can be used for that purpose. So design or modify your growing areas to limit dust and spread of dirt, as we've already talked about, and store the growing media in a dry covered area. So we went to this nursery here. You can see it's got basically a drawbridge. So the roof opens, the truck can come in, pour it in. Uh, this, I was impressed. Seems like that sort of a situation should be relatively easy to implement. Keeps the rain off, keeps you, or is reducing risk of organic matter. You can see how the concrete, if for whatever reason water does get in there, it flows out of a growing media bay. Okay. So more hygiene staff, have staff clean their hands, disinfest equipment. Clean the benches regularly, particularly in propagation between each crop line with some sort of a quaternary ammonia uh, a product or bleach. There are some other products out there that are specifically designed for disinfesting benches. Whenever possible, you know, grow the plants on raised mesh and or on raised, raised beds at the very least and make sure your water doesn't pond. Okay, grow healthy plants. We've talked about this quite a lot, and in the interest of time, we might keep on moving. But basically, poorly drained and poorly aerated media will reduce your plant growth and put you at high risk for getting a soil-borne pathogen. So we've talked about monitoring, monitoring the plant health, monitoring water quality. There are more and more technologies out there that will actually measure your pH, your EC, leaf wetness, whole sort of, um, different nutrient levels even, I believe, in line. So you don't even have to pick out the machine. Now, obviously that takes some investment, but there are more and more of these technologies available that you can tap into to um, even then alert you when there is a problem. Recognize when plants are not healthy and take action early. It's really easy to go, oh, that doesn't look quite right, but I'm really busy with something else. I'll come back to it and then forget. I mean, we've all done it. Um, and putting in place some systems so that you remember to come back to it and investigate is important. All right, so identify the pathogens or identify if there's not a pathogen. So we sometimes will have growers send in a plant, it's been really wet, they've got wet feet, haven't been able to do anything about that. We wanna to check to make sure that there isn't something nasty in there, or if, if we can be relatively assured that it's just from wet feet. And then also there are those cases where people send in wilting plants and they don't even realize they've got a root rot. Hopefully, after this webinar, you'll be one of the people that goes, oh, look, the roots aren't good at an early stage. Send in the plant material to the diagnostic lab. Find out what the problem is so that you can take more specific action to stop the problem at an early stage. And you can answer some of the questions about where the pathogen came from, potentially. How does it spread? And whether or not you're doing something that is favoring disease development. Hopefully you can modify some of those things. So quarantining the plants that may be infected but aren't showing symptoms. So if you've got a scattering of infected plants and you think, well, 
is this whole crop line infected or is this particular stock on this bed infected and it's right next to some other plants of the different varieties. Maybe I'm going to move these ones that are obviously going to well, get rid of the ones that are unsaleable, but the ones that are looking healthy that may be infected, maybe you want to move those ones away so that they're not likely to spread to other things and just monitor their health to make sure that they are going to be something that is a saleable item. You can also limit staff movement to different areas. If you know that there is a problem, if you limit st staff movement, then they're more less likely to get the infective material onto their person and move it around, whether it's the shoes or their hands. And this is an, oops, an important point. It's not recommended to sell plants reasonably suspected to be infected. And we'll get at the next slide, we'll talk about that more. Avoiding holding over old stock is important. Old stock potentially may have pathogens present. And if you keep it there, and it, particularly if it's next to your new stock, then it can spread the pathogen to your next generation. And fungus nets, as we've mentioned, can spread, the larvae and the adults can spread plant pathogens. And there is a pest management available on that FMS website. Use resistant varieties wherever possible uh, and root stocks, obviously. I think most people are pretty familiar with that one. Now, removing the unsaleable plants is important, as we've said. We cannot recommend selling plants we you know are infected. And this is going to become more important. And we've talked about these in some of the workshops that we go to. There is a general biosecurity obligation or duty of care that is being written into the biosecurity acts in each of the different states. If it's not there already, it probably will be soon. It takes quite a lot of effort to modify the act. And most of the states are doing so or have done so or are in the process of doing it. So even if it's not there yet, it will be. And I'm just from the Queensland Act. Um, while this is Queensland specific, all the states are doing similar sorts of statements. And I'll just read it out, these two statements. If you are a commercial grower, you are expected to stay informed about the pests and diseases that could affect or be carried by your crops, as well as weeds and pest animals that could be on your property. You are also expected to manage them appropriately. How much the person manages the, managing the activity knows or should be reasonably expected to know about the risk about how dangerous it is or how it is spread. The more you know or should be expected to know, the more action you are expected to take. So ignorance is not an option. If you are growing plants, you are expected to know the sorts of things that could be affecting them, and you're expected to take action to mitigate that risk every step of the line. Now that it's in legislature, there is the potential, of obviously, for litigation. So in our workshops we've been doing this year, Integrated Crop Management, or IPM, it's your system to keep you safe. If you are monitoring your plants and have records of your plants being healthy, and when there's a little blip, you go, okay, yes, we chucked those ones out. We've done these actions to mitigate the risk. Now my plants are healthy. I'm producing healthy plants. When they left my property, they were healthy, and I've got records of the roots being healthy and this and so on and so forth. If someone comes back to you and go, well, tell me why we shouldn't be pinning this on you. I mean, it's not going to be exactly like that, but tell me why, how you know that your plants were healthy. And you go, well, here you go. These are my records. That's your insurance to say, I'm doing the right thing. And the uh, all of the best management practice, the FMS guidelines are there to support you. And I encourage you to check out the FMS website because it has an extraordinary number of resources available that you can tap into. You don't need to remake the wheel. If we get time, Andrew, at the end of the webinar, we might see if we can access the FMS website so people can see yep. how easy it is. Yep. yep. Sounds good. All right. So the chemical management of root rot pathogens Stemming from that, you can see where from a pathologist and from a best practice point of view, it's hard to recommend their use, except perhaps in specific instances, to protect healthy plants. You know you've got a high risk. You have a good suspicion that 
these plants are healthy. There's no evidence of any of the symptoms being present. Then perhaps a fungicide that's targeted to that particular pathogen can be worthwhile to protect it. But otherwise, generally your fungicides mask the presence of the root rot pathogen. So they might reduce the symptoms so that you get it out the door, but then it can come back to bite you. Because down the track, eventually, you'll, if that's happened, then a plant can become, the disease can then reinstate itself, let's say with poor environmental conditions or other plant stress, and all of a sudden, your, the plants are, are dying down the supply chain. So the best practice is always supplying healthy plants free of pests and pathogens. Successful use, as we said, it, it relies on correct identification. Some products are suited to certain types of pathogens, but not to others. And really, it's about applying it to protect healthy plants. Now, in terms of biological control, in natural environments, the soil environment has a whole suite of microorganisms. And, and we are getting towards the end. There's only a few more slides because I'm noticing the time. Anyway, natural environments have a suite of organisms that can suppress the germination and infection process of plant pathogens. That can be quite difficult to reproduce in a nursery, particularly, I mean, where your growing media, it's soilless, it's designed to be free of a lot of these organisms. So you can apply um, various different products to help prevent disease, to sort of fill with that void. And that can be beneficial. Maybe not in all cases, but it can be. It's been shown to be beneficial in certain cases. Now, some fungi and bacteria have been used as biocontrol agents to suppress disease and provide partial control. But they're generally not very fast acting and they will not eradicate the pathogen. So from a nursery point of view, we can't recommend they're used just the same way that we can't really recommend applying a fungicide to get rid of a pathogen, a, a soil-borne or root rot pathogen. But hopefully that makes sense. They have their place in prevention. The other important point on these biocontrol agents is that the fungicides that are applied to the crop can reduce the biocontrol agent. If you're putting on a trichoderma, if you're putting on even some of the bacterial things, and you, then you apply a copper product or various fungicides, don't turn off your brain. They are called fungicides and they will attack a lot of different fungicides. And generally, beneficial species are more strongly affected than the pathogens or pests. So one take home message here, when if you're considering biological control agents, you can talk to the, your producer of the trichoderma or the different products. I'd highly recommend applying your product to half your crop or to a section of the crop, even if it's relatively small, and not applying the product to the rest of the crop or applying different products to the different crops or multiple products to the different to a section of the crop and see what benefit they show over time. And that way you can have confidence that you're not wasting your money. So Andrew, would you apply that um, in the potting media before you pot up your plants or could you apply that after you've actually planted the crop? That's a really good question. I actually don't know. I, I would probably use it as per whatever label or the manufacturer suggests is the best way to use it. Um, I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not sure. Any, if anybody has experience with these things and wants to write it in and share that, please do so. Just in conclusion, this is pretty much the last slide. So. Soil-borne pathogens can be managed in a proactive, when you use a proactive approach, and it's recommended to implement as many actions as possible. But you use substantial care if you're applying fungicides against soil.
soil borne pathogens. And questions? Anybody? Yes, Andrew. You still yeah. can you still hear me? Yep. Yes, um, I can. Yeah, we've got this um back with regards to trichodermia. Tri oh, trichoderma, sorry. Uh where Simon is actually using trichoderma in his propagation process and mm -hmm. then following through in high risk crops in the areas every six months. And mm -hmm. he wants to know, will this be effective as a pre prevention or control method? It could be. It's hard to say whether it definitely will or if it definitely won't. Um, and what's difficult is, I mean, it's a biological organism. It may be really effective under certain conditions and not be as effective under other conditions. Just like a plant can get stressed in high heat, so too can the fungi. It might not be high heat, but it could be really dry conditions. If you get, a, for whatever reason, the irrigation has a problem, the plants dry out, that potentially might affect your biological organism, reduce the inoculant, and reduce the amount of the product there, and then potentially it may, you may have a failure. It may well, I would recommend reading up, see what data is available. With all of these sorts of products, I'm very wary of salespeople that don't aren't willing to give you data to back up their statements. Um, and I guess too, I guess um, with biological control agents, there are so many out there that some of them may be suitable to one condition or one particular environment, others are more suitable to other environments. Yes. So it makes Absolutely. it very difficult to ascertain how effective they're gonna be or not. Right. Which is and another reason too, why to do the in-field test. Yeah, sorry, John. Yeah, yeah. And I guess too that um, in a potting mix, it's I guess it's not quite biologically inactive, but there's more chance for pathogens to take over, and any biocontrol agents they also may be able to get a handle or hand or foothold in that media, but if they're not suited to the conditions that they're growing in, then they just may not yep. work at all. Now, one final point that I think I uh, have not made is pots. Uh, can you raise your hand if you reuse your pots? There are some growers that do. I, I do see at least one hand, a couple of hands going up. Thank you. Yep. Um, when you're reusing your pot, it's very important to get rid of all of the organic matter and heat is far more effective at disinfesting your pots than let's say chlorine. Chlorine breaks down very quickly with organic matter and then you can have failure. And we've had situations where a grower has used chlorine and left bits of organic matter on the pot and expected, oh, well, the chlorine, that'll clean it up. But when we've gone and collected the root material off of the pots that have already gone through their disinfesting uh, action, the pathogen is still present. We were able to isolate it. So be very careful and question whether or not it's worthwhile. I mean, best practice is new pots each time. And obviously there are some waste considerations that you need, want to take into account and also the financial situation you want to take into account. But be careful when you're using your pots because it's a very obvious way of continuing the life cycle of soil-borne pathogens. Now, I, I guess we are mindful that we have gone over slightly time-wise, but can you just raise your hand if you want, Andrew, to run through how to access the FMS website? If we get enough supporters, then Andrew might be able to just quickly run through yep. that. Yep, okay. looks like there are a couple, do. three. Yeah, like okay, it. great. Um, let me just drag this over here and see if I can. Okay, can you all see Google? I think you should be able to. Um, yep. Now, I'm pretty sure I've got it bookmarked. 
there. Oh, look, I'll go to the home page to start with. Um, those are our fact sheets. I'll get there. Okay, so we're getting to the home page. It's just the watch pot never boils, right? <laughs> it normally doesn't take this long. Yeah. Uh, and I guess okay, we're so all the, eager for a cup of tea. <laughs> uh, it's not going. But so these are the fact sheets that we're producing for a part of this project. And now it's gone. Okay, so we've got this is the home page. You can get the different guidelines, NIASA, Eco, Hort, Biosecure. These are valuable. If you buy them once, then you get access to the updated versions and you can download them again without having to pay again. It's worthwhile looking through those, putting into practice as many of the actions as you can, even if you don't want to become NIASA accredited. Or even if you don't want to become biosecure HACCP, but if you want to see what the absolute best practice is, go here and you can download the, you get access to the database. They, they're developing an online system where you can actually put in your monitoring data online and have it go on your phone, let's say, and have it go to a web-based platform. Um, the technical information has Lots of technical information, as the name would suggest. There are a lot of different topics. And we'll just go to, let's say, irrigation and water, because that is so important when it comes to managing soil-borne pathogens. There's disinfestation techniques, different topics of how to use drip irrigation, how to, I think there's one on how to make your bottom up. Uh, uh, irrigation system, drainage, there are various videos. It just goes on and on and on. So I'm just, I'll go back and hopefully it'll be faster. Here we go. The growing media, there's a similar, uh, not quite as many topics, but the pests, the diseases and weeds, there are various different topics here various different methods of monitoring crops, monitoring site surveillance. And it sounds like a dull topic here, the site surveillance procedure, but actually I thought that was quite a good topic uh, that might help you make sure you don't miss anything when you're walking around and doing monitoring. Now, unfortunately, um, our fact sheets are in a slightly different place. I'm not sure exactly why they're in a different place, but they are. They're in these up here in the pest diseases fact sheets. And then there are also the pest and disease management plans. The management plans go into more detail and more specific recommendations. There aren't as many of them, but they are more substantial documents. Uh, Tony, just have a type into the screen if I'm missing anything uh, in particular. Uh, Tony Philippi is with us, who's uh, an NGI or uh, Green Life Industry rep. It goes around and does NIASA audits. Um, I'm going to go back to the home and point maybe the e-learning. Um, e-learning, when you're logged in, there are a whole heap of different videos and questions with in this e-learning portal and what we what you can do is use these resources to help train your staff so you don't have to do you don't have to remake the wheel particularly if you're getting backpackers or something in that, or people that might not be well versed in horticulture you can go okay well you're doing this sort of job so i want you to be aware of this video, that fact sheet, that fact sheet, and they can go and do it. And then you, it doesn't have to be quite as um, intensive on you. There's also um, potential to take this information and go, okay, well, this information is really relevant, but I'm going to just tweak it that little bit because my nursery has this particular factor and these things aren't as relevant. Um, and Tony's, Tony's just um, 
typed in that, that e-learning is free for any staff uh, to register and use. So feel free to access it um, at any time. Great. Uh, so I think make, all you make, have to do make is make the most out of it. I think you just have to log in. There's a way of logging in. Once you get into the e-learning portal, that's what it is. Then you log in, and, and that's that's free as well. Um, I'm not sure if I'm logged in. I know I do have a username and password, but uh, I don't know about you, but I always forget the password. And there are more than three. <laughs> it's it's a matter of logging in, and then there are more. Okay, so hopefully that just about does it. Yep. So uh, we've certainly run gone over time this this webinar, Andrew. Um, yep. We might call it quits there. Um, don't forget there is another webinar, fifth um, of September, um, on looking at leaf feeding insects for those that are interested. So yep. keep an eye on that and make sure you register and tell all your friends. And yes, we'll catch up with you all again next month. Thanks very yep. much, and everyone, for for being part of this webinar. Yep. And lastly, if you want to send us a question, you can send it to this email address. And we will send out an email sort of summarizing some of the important links and a link to a survey uh, in either this afternoon or tomorrow. So then you'll have our details again. All right. OK, Great. thanks very much, everyone. And we'll catch up with you again next month. Great. Cheers. Thank you.